winding back to an old-fashioned shack along the road to Gundagai. Tonight on Our Century, our love affair with the bush, the romance of life in small country towns and down on the farm. For as long as most of us remember, wool has been the golden fleece, our greatest industry. Those good old days when Australian prosperity rode on the sheep's back. And back of beyond, where the world came in on the squeaky voice of the pedal radio. They were the sights and the sounds of Australia. This old shearing shed was built about a hundred years ago. So it's a good place to stop and think of where we've come and where we've been. Today, of course, most of us live in the cities, yet we love the romance of life on the land. It's part of being Australian. Henry Lawson and Banjo Patterson wrote a lot about this sort of life. The backbreaking struggle of the shearers and of the pioneers, the droughts and the flooding rains that could destroy all the effort, all the hard work, and they often did. But poetry and stories are about as close as most of us get to this life these days. Yet it's part of our culture. The real Australia, we say, is in the bush. <laughs> I found the kangaroo. <laughs> Where was he? Down the well. Is he dead? He smells like it. <laughs> Joe, did you get that water from there? Yes, ma. Dad and Dave. For nearly half a century, they were practically national figures. You go down to the well and get that kangaroo out. And mind you get him all out. There's too much body in that. The rough and ready humour of Dad the battling wheat farmer, and Dave, his dopey son. Homegrown comedy that had been inspired by an Australia that mostly lived on the land. Back in 1900, we were a farming and mining nation. Two thirds of us lived outside what were then quaintly called the capital cities. All through the 19th century, the government pushed farming to open up the country. It was usually cheap land. And once you cleared it, it was yours. Australian industry was just beginning. Even then, many of the goods turned out by our factories were destined for the bush. Back in the 1880s and 90s, the city workers who made them had often dreamt that one day they would own a small farm themselves. Farming seemed to offer a chance to build for the future, the chance to leave something for your kids. But the truth was that over the century, Australia could be a cruel and heartless place to farm anything. And he remembers the second harvest, when the rush crept into the crop and turn the wheat back into the soil, dead and useless. He had to burn the crops that year. The kids thought it was wonderful, the best fire they'd ever seen. Wheat had withered and failed to prosper until the turn of the century when special types were found that could cope with the dry Australian climate and our even drier soils. By the 1920s, the golden grain had leapt from 2 to 16% of our national exports. But 
But the real money was in war. By 1934, when 10,000 sheep were mustered for the opening sequence of the old Aussie movie, The Squatter's Daughter, every red-blooded Australian knew that the country rode on the sheep's back. Sheep at Australia, it seemed, were made for each other. They could be turned loose in the never-ending paddocks, then brought in once a year for shearing. By the 1930s, sheep accounted for nearly half our national income. Wool was as Australian as wombats and much more profitable. Some farmers even wanted the mighty Merino on our national coat of arms. This monstrous beast was an engineering miracle, a scientific special. In roughhouse sheds like these, they produced the best and finest wool in the world. Generations of soldiers went off to war singing Walsing Matilda, the haunting story of a swaggy who drowned himself rather than be arrested for sheep stealing. But if there was one thing that set the rules about farming in Australia, it was drought. Australia is the most arid continent on earth. And throughout the century, cycles of chronic drought would repeatedly bring this country to its knees. Despite the romance of the bush and life on the farm, the reality is that we have a climate as hot as hell and as dry as dust. And maybe that's why the best Aussie humour is as dry as the weather. I'll bet if he was behind a plough, he'd leave a furrow like a corkscrew. As a matter of fact, I would too. You see, I, I've never handled a plough. Oh, it must be marvellous to be a pioneer. It is. You're dead before they discover it. The pedal radio. For years it was the sound that broke the silence and the numbing isolation faced by Australians back and beyond. The radio was a masterstroke of Aussie ingenuity. You had to have the pedal generator because most properties didn't have electricity. Developed in the 1920s, along with that other symbol of Outback Australia, the flying doctor service, it transformed life in the bush. When the Queen made her first visit in 1954, a guest appearance on the Flying Doctor radio from Broken Hill was an absolute must. My husband and I send to you who are listening, and indeed to all who live and work in the great outback of Australia, our sincere thanks. This was royal recognition of the other Australia, far from the madding crowds of the city. We people of Australia's great outback acknowledge our humble allegiance to you as our sovereign. I am speaking from a wireless transceiver 300 miles from your majesty at Broken Hill. You know, they might have been speaking from the moon. In the coming years, like the sound of locusts, radio was heard everywhere. For generations of bush kids, including me, the radio was how we went to school. Girls and boys, I'm going to recite to you part of a poem by an Australian, Dorothea McKellar. School of the Air meant correspondence lessons prepared by a special group of teachers in the city and then sent out on the mail truck. Now here is the poem. I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, 
1946, this film, School in the Mailbox, showed the world how different and how difficult life in the Australian bush could be. As well as everything else, it was usually Mum who had to be the teacher. This film was nominated for an Academy Award. One spring day at the farm, Mother Duck was on her way to the pond. The film also touched a collective feeling in many Australians, wherever they lived, that somehow the spirit of this country was in the bush. There's a track winding back, oh, and along the road to Gandaga, where the blue guns are growing and the parents is blowing beneath the sunny sky. Where my daddy and mother Australia was becoming more urbanised, yet by the early 1920s, about a third of us still lived in country towns or in the bush. For some reason, Gundagai, with its famous dog on the tucker box, stuck in the public mind as the typical Aussie bush town. In 1932, the Prime Minister himself unveiled the monument that's been famous ever since. But while Gundagai had its dog, other towns were also on the move. In 1926, in Varela, New South Wales, put on a show for the cameras. At a time when transport was bad and roads were even worse, the local country town was the centre of the universe. So when farmers came to town on shopping day, chances were the local store was stocked to the ceiling with goods whose brand names reflected the Aussie bush heritage. Everything from the old favourite Billy T to Rosella tomato sauce and kangaroo brand ropes. But even in the bush, you had to make time to play up. Which meant, after you built the town's churches, you put in a racetrack, which gave you a good reason to go back to church. Of course, it was often a bit rough and ready, a bit how's your father, but taken just as seriously as down in the big smoke. Watching me own oh, Cattlemen, hard yak on hard tucker. Chips Rafferty was the long, lanky, laconic bushy who rolled his own cigarettes and called a spade a spade. For many, he was the quintessential Australian. For years, Chips was the closest thing we had to a big movie star. Not that we made a lot of movies in those days. Don't let them check, lead them right in. In 1946, the movie The Overlanders made this bloke famous. You'll come with me, won't you, Jackie? Where do, boss? Across three states. Western Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland to the sea. How long on the road, boss? For a year, maybe two. OK, I'll come with you. Wait till I tell the missus. I'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> and of course, the missus said yes. And the film was a hit. Proof that long before Crocodile Dundee, this romantic mix of rugged Aussie bushmen and outback scenery was the way we saw ourselves. Yet the Overlanders also marked the end of an era. The years after the war brought huge changes to the bush. Giant road trains were coming, speeding over specially built beef roads. And they would make the legendary cattle drive a thing of history. Also, from the late 1940s, tractors made horses suddenly obsolete. A thing of the past. In the war years, there'd been 800,000 horses working Australian farms. 
but within two decades, there were less than 50,000. The face of farming had changed forever. Country living conditions were looking up too. In the 50s, electricity found its way to the smaller bush communities at last. The State Electricity Authority is subsidising the cost, and now the local council has brought the lines to the farm. For years, country folk had had to make do with the old kerosene lamps. Ah, oh, the batteries are flat. And radios powered by batteries, which had to be taken to town for charging once a week. But now they had the power on, the newfangled appliances that city cousins used popped up in the bush stores as well. It gives me great pleasure in switching on your power. May it bring you much happiness. It's no wonder that country towns had switching on parties to celebrate. Like rain, this was worth dancing for. But the revolution had come. Australian life was now defined by the cities. Three million migrants had poured in after World War II, adding a dynamic new and different side to Australian life. Country Australia was no longer the backbone of the economy and tougher times were on the way. For as long as most of us remember, wool has been the golden fleece, our greatest industry. But today it's reeling from the effects of a worldwide drop in prices. Righto, silo, 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 ladies and gentlemen, silo. Righto, there you are, you got the good fire, Harris. Anyway, the booming prosperity of the 50s evaporated as overseas producers anyway, drove down are. the prices. And as the wool stocks piled up, Australians suddenly saw a new angry farmer as the bush went into debt and demonstrations. They poured into the national capital from as far away as Cape York and Perth. Farmers across the Commonwealth of Australia are marching for their very survival. Have been out the bloody bush long enough! Right now, the bush is hanging on and hoping, but it's still a big part of our national personality. The Akubra hats and dryer bone coats, once the no-nonsense uniform of the outback, are now fashion statements in the suburbs. Whether it's an R.M. Williams store opening in London, or fashion shows for brands like Country Road, the designer world now sells the idea of the bush as chic. Lovely, a big, rich, sweet fruitcake that was actually dry. And the Chardonnay slurped at wine tastings is another symbol of the modern bush. This Aussie conversion to wine has been yet another revolution in our hedonistic habits. Back in the 1940s, this oyster-eating competition was a typical Aussie blowout, washed out, of course, with the mandatory bottle of beer. The fact is, Australia had been making wine since the last century. Ordinary Aussies just hadn't been drinking it. Maybe because wine was always linked to the high life, with a price tag to match. The cheap stuff was dismissed as plonk. Besides, why would you drink plonk when there was a cold beer available? But suddenly, some bright spark came up with the great Aussie invention, the wine cask, offering wine that you could drink at a price that you could afford. From the 1970s on, no party or home fridge was complete without one. Out in the vineyards, the winemakers were leading the way again. They were among the first to embrace the modern technology that made Australian wine some of the most consistent and affordable in the world. The old days of rough red and bull's blood were thankfully a thing of the past. And we weren't the only ones to appreciate it. Just across the channel from France, the biggest selling wine in Britain in the 1990s has been, you guessed it, Australian wine. Despite all the changes, despite all the high tech and whiz bangery of the last 50 years, Australians today still have a soft spot for the bush. And why wouldn't you? Maybe we don't dream of owning a farm with 
an old shearing shed like this one anymore, but we do know that bush towns and families on the land are part of the Aussie tradition. What makes us who we are and what makes us special. Well, boy, in your old giant hands, you circle to the south and you get a little moon shine in your mouth. You circle to the left, way down in Dover, reach right out, all hands over the lazy spile, the gents bow, and just swing that corner girl. And you leave her on the right and you circle to the left, go around. You know, Norma? Yes, Hal? I think I'll drench those sheep tomorrow.